what I believe is the final lecture on Durkheim suicide. Uh, we're going to be looking at my very favorite material in um, in all of Durkheim and some of my favorite material to teach in in, in all of sociological theory. Chapter six of Durkheim. This is the chapter uh, um, again. We're using the free press uh, version um, that he labels the individual forms of the different types of suicide, and it's it's a chapter that's that clearly most sociologists have never read. You know, one of the big uh, uh, claims about Durkheim that you find made by most sociologists is that he really didn't care about individual psychology at all. He was really only interested in social forces and, uh, you know, social facts, not individual consciousness. Here, we find that that's just not true. So even though he doesn't think that individual psychology is the cause of suicide, he nevertheless is very interested and very um, clear about uh, recognizing that the the uh, social unconscious uh, structures morality and structures moral energy within a society that leads people to have a particular uh, form of consciousness, right? That the consciousness people have, the conscious uh, awareness that they have of the causes of their behavior are supplemented by uh, social uh, uh, forces and and and, and moral uh, energy currents, right? So, uh, so society has an impact upon consciousness. Hence, if you're going to want to make sense of suicide, uh, you can you can detect Durkheim believes the um, impact of the array and the force of society on 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 the individual. So I'm trying to depict that here a little bit. I've got some images to look at. So um, I think um, that, you know, we've been using this um, sort of a map of suicide, the, the famous X model, right? And um, in which we're sort of differentiating between the um, egoism, anomy, fatalism, and altruism, recognizing that egoism and anomy are the two forms of suicide characteristic of modern capitalist society, whereas fatalism and altruism are the two forms of suicide characteristic of traditional villages, clans, and tribes. We also have been aware that fatalism and anomy are at opposite ends of a continuum uh, that sort of uh, um, traces the arc of one dimension of, of social integration, regulation, demands, and rules. I would say um, laws, basically, you know, the legal, regulatory, normative uh, uh, bonds of society. Egoism and altruism lay at, uh, again, extreme ends of another dimension of integration, and that is of attachment and identity or uh, to use, you know, um, uh, the, the, the totem, the identification with the totem, um, uh, the identification with the symbolic order, names, uh, uh, that kind of thing, right? So, so um, if we could put that in a kind of, um, I've got it. I'm, I'm going to use an old uh, drawing of mine uh, where, okay, so if I were to put these two forms, these two um, types of, of social bonds on um, to try to depict them in a picture, right? Um, um, actually, I have these. Hang on a second. We'll come back to that picture. I actually uh, printed it out, and I have it augmented right here. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, okay. So the... At the level of regulation, right, and that's the dimension that ties together fatalism and anomie, um, you really are looking at the dimension of, of energy flows, um, you know, with destructive anomie on one end and fatalism as the other end. This really deals with, you know, the moral rules of society, the laws, the legal, the legal mores, the norms, that kind of thing. So I'm going to put laws and norms here. So laws and norms are the regulatory apparatus that dictate the, the arrangement of members of a society, the ways in which people must uh, behave relative to each other, right? So they're not really about consciousness, they're really about conduct. 
and 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 you know legal obey you know obedience to uh to a ritual order or to uh you know to a legal order of some kind right so so the regulatory apparatus the regulatory integration uh takes place uh, at the level of behavior but the um but the other form of integration uh, takes place at the level of of language names identity like totem identity so this would be not integration this would be um, uh, the level of uh, let's put identity in here I think um, yeah um, and so that and I guess yes Durkheim does use that but that operates at the level of the imaginary right so this is where um, you know, self-reflection, reflection on society, reflection on on symbolic uh, congruence between oneself and another, that kind of thing occurs. So this is the dimension of energy currents, um, you know, um, with, um, yeah, yeah, with altruism and, I kind of get mistakes in here, and um, egoism as endpoints, all right? So the difference between the collective consciousness and the individual consciousness. So if you have a collective consciousness, you literally are integrated into a social order. That's the language that Durkheim uses, especially talking about, you know, like the religious order, the Jewish identity, where um, where that 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 identity that one has with one's fellow members of a society um, keeps one in the world, right? Because you are identical with the world and not separated from it. So egoists tend to have a very weak identification with a totem or with the group itself or with uh, other people. They tend to be uh, self-identified, right? So this integration is weak. And then people who are suffering really from anomi have weak regulation, okay? So that the world is not scripted, um, the ruts that channel uh, human contact with other uh, with other members of society aren't worn very deep, and there's a lot of sort of random play, okay? So, um, so yeah, so here, you know, like, like, like the imaginary level of, of attachment and identity um, operates primarily through consciousness, uh, egoism, altruism uh, versus, you know, the individual and collective, and you know, you know, the identification of the group versus the self, whereas the regulatory dimension operates much through, you know, through behavior, rules of conduct, laws, and so on. Okay, all right. So that gives us the two dimensions there of of um, of of the four basic forms. So let's kind of review those real quick. So um, okay, so here's egoism, kind of a quick sketch of the egoist. Um, the egoist invests this in the self and becomes detached from society. The self is all too real. Society and other people seem distant and kind of unreal. Narcissism in mild forms is normal and functional for moderns. I'm, I'm afraid that's true. Um, and Durkheim recognized that the egoist isolation, however, works against them. Egoists view their um, life as their own private possession. They owe nothing to others. They limit commitments to others and care little for ongoing group life. When an egoist faces setbacks or losses, the damage to the self is great. Without group ties, egoists can fall into deep depression, hence their propensity to suicide. And there's more to it than that, but that's the basic outline, right? So in traditional societal, egoism is weak. It doesn't exist very much um, and would be very dysfunctional. While in modern society, egoism in mild forms is necessary and normal, right? The moral order in the modern society demands a kind of slackening of the integrative bonds of identity and attachment, right? You must be relatively uh, uh, individualistic. Now, altruism is sort of the opposite of that. So, um, yeah, so here's sort of an image of, of of an altruist. So there you are, you're a little individual and you're overridden and overmastered and overpowered by the big other, by society, right? Uh, so in altruism, the self lacks clarity and significance, while the group and its gods seem much more real, tangible, and important. Altruists see their individual lives and fate as less important than the collective life of the group. So you're willing to die for your group, right? It is a good day to die for the group, right? Altruism is the essence of mechanically bonded society, as in uh, Durkheim's division of labor. So in traditional society, altruism is strong and functional, while in modern society, altruism is weakened by egoism and is dysfunctional in extreme forms, right? Uh, modern society doesn't treat e uh, altruists very well. 
um, egos can rise to the top of, of the political, social, and economic order, while altruists who give themselves to the group often find themselves ground down to the bottom. So suicides in traditional societies are often altruistic. Gods or the group demands that one sacrifice oneself for the good of the group. Warrior deaths, widow deaths, religious sacrificial deaths, you know, the things we looked at in one of the previous videos. So altruism is literally selflessness. So there it is. In altruism, uh, you don't really see the individual self. You see the group. The group is real. You are less real, right? And you're only significant because you're part of the group. The group is more real to a person than their own ego or self. Altruistic people do not act in their best interest and in the individual best interest, but in the interest of others. Durkheim's altruistic suicide is particularly characteristic of mechanical solidarity. They die for the good of the group, the warrior ethic, right? So altruism is strong and functional um, in, in traditional society, uh, and it's weakened by egoism and becomes, uh, again, less functional for the individual in modern society. His next chapter, then, he dealt with anomi, anonymic suicide. Um, so, again, a little sketch of that. Durkheim placed great emphasis upon the problem of anomi, uh, the experience of, I would say, again, let's just use, you know, namelessness. So, that would be the French's nom uh, and normlessness, right? So, a no me uh, would literally be a, a world without names, without a symbolic order that holds and, and makes sense, that without the kind of, you know, the stitch or the cut between the symbolic order, the imaginary order, and the real order, right? Things seem free-floating and kind of um, unregulated and senseless. So namelessness and normlessness, I think, works just fine. Enemy results from poor regulation of everyday life, a lack of adjustment between values, norms, and habits. Um, yeah, and prevailing life conditions. It's made worse by abrupt change, crises, and the removal of existing regulatory forces, like, you know, the informal... Uh, social control exercise in villages and tribes. The individual experiencing anomi cannot name and cannot meaningly symbolize their experience, nor find a norm that guides them and tells them what to do. So this is it. it, it you know, anomi is a very traumatic um, 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 social unconscious that leads people to consciously pursue ends that they cannot uh, achieve and to achieve ends that they don't really find satisfying once they they attain them, right? So there's that kind of, uh, again, like the ruts of society are not worn deep and the the drive to achieve and to obtain objects uh, often fails, and even when those objects are attained, they fail to provide the kind of satisfaction one expected. So it's an unregulated world. So anomie is highly destructive in traditional society. It actually is one of the acidic uh, uh, agents that eat up a traditional society, right? Rapid change um, um, and, and uh, the breakdown of the ritual order is literally what ends the traditional society. Uh, again, we talked about, um, uh, you know, unpunished sacrilege is probably the most um, acidic force you could have in a society when, that just breaks it down. Uh, so fatalism uh, gets lost. And when fatalistic structures break down, you wind up with anomi, right? So modern society's mild anomi is normalized, right? It remains destructive at high levels. So, so to Durkheim, again, you know, if you're going to live in a modern society or in cities, a world of division of labor, constantly changing uh, uh, professions and so on, um, constantly changing deadlines and timelines and so on, you really have little choice uh, but to live in an anomic world. However, anomi is a destructive force, a traumatic force that can be aided, controlled, regulated, um, you know, with good law, with good government, um, and, you know, his book, The Division of Labor, begins with a preface that outlines uh, just that argument, right? And it ends with an indictment of capitalist society that is too anomic, right? That you should use, he argues, government as a mechanism to control the anomic forces so that they don't, you know, crush human life. All right, the final form then is fatalism. So here's the image we've been using uh, for the... Uh, uh, for this section. So fatalistic suicide occurs when a person sees a next. So again, we're going beyond Durkheim's text here, right? Remember that he only has that one footnote 
um, uh, that outlines what fatalism is. He doesn't really include it very much in his analysis. But fatalistic suicide, from what we can tell, would occur when a person sees a negative freedomless future unfolding all too clearly before them. Rather than seeing the future as open-ended, the future appears fixed and unchangeable. So essentially, fatalists view everyday life as a prison and commit suicide to shorten their life sentence. So in traditional society, fatalism is strong and mostly functional, while in modern society, fatalism is disrupted by anomy. Again, you know, you know, remember, like even Marx is sort of the overriding power of, of uh, you know, of norms of, of traditional ways of traditional culture um, that locks people in. When we get to Weber, we're going to find Weber makes a similar argument that there's a kind of fatalistic quality of traditional society. And, and it gets disrupted by the forces of anomi. So suicide in church society was traced to fatalism in Durkheim's uh, little footnote, right? When slaves or others trapped in a totalitarian system lose the capacity to desire. That's basically what he says, right? They get locked in uh, to this world of infinite demand, right? Not Durkheim's words, but it should be infinite demands. Um, right, so we talked about young married men or women, married women who couldn't have children. They're locked into a marriage they can't get out of, even though it's not a productive of the object of children. You know, perhaps the man is sterile and they can't um, uh, achieve child, uh, you know, uh, children through that particular man, but they're locked in, they can't get out. So again, so this idea that you can't pursue your own desires, you can't pursue your own ends, there's infinite demands placed upon you by this ultimately powerful regulatory structure. Yeah, so slaves, I would say that those deep in debt or those stuck in poverty uh, come very close to that. You know, debt slavery is the fate of those who, uh, within a society, who are unable to meet their obligations. So there is a real uh, affinity between those who feel overburdened by debt payments and those who are slaves. The two things shade off into each other. Um, okay. So, um, so then in this chapter, then, we've sort of outlined uh, so far um, the four basic forms of, of anomi, altruism, uh, fatalism, and egoism, right? All right. All right. So what I want you to think about now is that, uh, again, this is a little sketch I made years ago, is that to think about um, that societies come together, they aggregate human beings. Remember Marx's concept of the social jelly that's extracted from people in production? Well, there's a, you know, there's a social energy or moral energy is extracted from human beings. Remember what Durkheim, or how Freud put it? Um, society grabs us by blocking the realization of, of our desires or the um, uh, satisfaction of drives. They block that, right, with taboos. That generates all this energy that then gets used by society uh, to uh, sustain a ritual order of some kind. So that's what society is, right? It's an aggregation of human beings who wind up controlled, managed, uh, um, uh, condensed by society uh, in, 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 in order to generate uh, the moral energy to worship totems and to avoid taboos. So it's a moral energy strain. That's what it is. So human beings come together and they generate moral energy. The moral energy is generated by the people in society, but from the people in society, for any individual, it seems to come from without, right? So it it bears down upon individuals as a, as a constraining force upon them. They can't quite see that it is their own energy that winds up making society itself. Okay. So, um, so what I got here is this depiction of moral energy currents, a phrase that Durkheim uses, right? So, uh, so arrangements of, so of society shape consciousness of individuals uh, and shape the energy flows between them. So this is what the social unconscious is, right? So to Durkheim, uh, traditional societies are structured so that the tap, <laughs> the flow of the, of the moral energy out of the social tap um, is heavily uh, in the fatalistic and altruistic directions, right? So little people here are standing in the positions to capture the flow of energy from, um, from a traditional society. Modern society, the flow of moral energy goes in the direction of egoism and anomie. Okay, now members of a society don't experience this directly. They don't understand this. They have a consciousness that, again, in a traditional society, is all about the honoring of totems and the avoidance of taboos. And in modern society, it's all about the pursuit of desires and um, through consumption and the production of, uh, you know, finding oneself a position in the social structure through production, 
getting value extracted out. It's all about the play of value. So this is all about values. This is all about value in Marx's term. Okay. So these moral energy currents. So this is what the unconscious is, right? The unconscious um, of society then uh, shapes consciousness with different forms of, of regulation and imaginary integration. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So let's go with that. And then, so that's um, the basic model. Now let's get to the complete one which is here. Okay, so in this chapter now, uh, Durkheim is going to outline um, a total of 11 different forms of suicide, which correspond to 11 different flows of moral energy or different uh, kind of shapes of moral energy currents. So again, this is sort of an old cobweb sketch I'd made in a class to try to, to, try to uh, show how this works. So if you begin with that previous image of the flow of moral energy coming uh, from the social tap um, onto something like, you know, the field of social action or something like that, right? And that, you know, the four corners are, are occupied by egoism, enemy, altruism, and fatalism, right? This is a little bit more complete picture. So in this chapter, Durkheim is going to specify... Um, um, subtypes or secondary types uh, or secondary forms of of the um, of of the of, of altruism of anomi and of egoism. Right, there's going to be secondary forms, and then he's going to specify uh, compound forms like egoistic anomi, which is going to be a combination of. Let's see, where's of. Uh, um, yeah, egoism is on the back side there. So there's egoism back there. And um, um, no, he, yeah, yeah, egoism is back there. Anomy is here. So egoistic anomy is the combination of the two. Anomic altruism is the combination of those two. Um, and then there's going to be, um, yeah, so it, you, you get the idea. I don't like the picture now. I can see there's actually errors to it, okay? So the idea is, that, again, uh, if this is the field, uh, the social field, Traditional societies um, tend to um, generate and um, um, trade in the flow of moral energy that takes an altruistic and fatalistic form. So that's your traditional society with the little totem at the center and the taboo avoidance and so on. So the tap of moral energy tends to create, again, a social unconscious that that leads to altruistic and fatalistic behavior. Modern societies, we have up here, you know, cities and, you know, um, probably a, a Starbucks there or something like that. Anyway, tend to create moral currents uh, that are anomic and egoistic, right? And so those moral energy currents tend to uh, flow. Again, the social unconscious is structured that that's the forces that push people. Okay, so in this chapter then, he's going to be specifying two subtypes of anomy, Two subtypes of egoism. Um, th um, yeah, let me get this here. Three subtypes of altruism, which he already sort of uh, has talked about earlier. He's just going to give him a little bit more specificity in this chapter, right? At fatalism, he won't talk about, but then he'll talk about these three compound forms that combine energy streams. So again, I've just only got it depicted here in one place, but but like if altruism and anomy are flowing off of the social field at opposite corners, anomic altruism is going to live right in the middle of those two things, it's going to be a combination of those two energy currents. So you said you're going to be more increasing the, the moral temperature um, uh, with, with two different energy streams. Okay. All right. So should we jump within this? So um, I'm trying to think how I want to do this. I think to save time, let's just jump into my sort of, I, I have a way of teaching this where I use uh, psychoanalytic um, language and thought to sort of combine with Lacan and and, and Freud a little bit here. So I like to, to, to teach this in terms of desire. So again, there's a structure, there's a social unconscious that's structured so that consciousness um, takes on a particular form. And that, that the desire, which is again, like to Lacan and Freud, the thing that really propels us out into society, right? We're blocked in the realization of immediate desires and then we're given a substitute desire so that we can ultimately get our drive satisfied and some variant of our desires realized 
if we follow the rules, right? If we pursue uh, the honor of the totem and the avoidance of the taboo, we will ultimately get a payback of some kind, right? So desire is is the center, the central way in which an individual gets plugged into the social order. That's Freud, that's Lacan. Okay, so so egoistic uh, then, so, so the egoist is someone who, um, yeah, let's, I, I got, this is too, it's too, it's too early. Let's come back to this in a moment. It's too early. Um, I'm trying to think how I want to do this. Yeah. All right. We don't have a lot of time. So let's go ahead. And I see the hook. How does that sound? That's it. Let's jump into the book and we'll use that as our primary way to get in. So, so 277, he says, we're going to look at these individual forms. The individual forms begin to be specified on 278 at the bottom, where Durkheim uh, begins to outline, um, you know, uh, egoist, egoistic suicide, right? So, so he divides egoistic suicide into two subtypes. One is stoicism or stoic egoism, uh, as we're going to find is the infinite self reflection right this is the person caught in infinite self-reflection throughout this entire chapter durkheim uses historical examples and literary examples you know characters whose actions seem to manifest in kind of pure form of uh, this specific um um you know type of consciousness that uh, uh that he's writing about all right so egoistic suicide he talks about uh, lemertine's raphael Look at some of the stuff. Melancholic languor, uh, which releases all the springs of action. He's unwilling to emerge from himself. Uh, lost in activity, made up in thought of inner life. Um, let me see some of these other terms. Like a stoic. Consciousness becomes self-preoccupied. Takes itself as its proper and unique study. Get caught in self-observation, self-analysis. Uh, become enamored of yourself. Increasingly detaching yourself from everything external emphasizing the isolation in which you live to the point of worship, self-absorption, attaching, uh, avoiding attaching oneself to others. All movement is in a sense altruism. All social energy, all social movement is really altruistic in a sense, says Durkheim, right? In that it is centrifugal and disperses existence beyond its own limitations. However, getting caught up in reflection is always personal and egoistic. So by reflection, again, he means just that, that sort of, you know, daydreaming, uh, thinking about one's uh, personal life and personal thoughts, that kind of thing. All right. If a person like this, a stoic egoist, loves, it is not to give himself to another person in fecund union, um, but to me mediate, <laughs> meditate upon his love, right? I get into love, apparently, uh, this person would say, not in order to give myself to another, but in order to suffer from love and be able to write about it or something, right? They are dissipated. Passions are appearances and sterile, uh, dissipated and futile imagining, producing nothing external to themselves. All right, so then he goes on and he just say, look, you get caught up in too much self-reflection. You're going to uh, be in a situation of a langor, langor, right? Of all my surroundings, marvelous harmony with my own langor, right? Um, uh, melancholy, uh, a lively melancholy, a human disease, um, attracts rather than pains. Death resembles a voluptuous lapse into the infinite. I love that line. Uh, uh, avoid all distracting society to wrap myself in silent solitude and frigidity in the midst of whatever uh, company I should encounter. My spiritual isolation is a shroud. I just no longer desire to, um, to see men. So uh, it's infinity, right? Uh, to think is to abstain from action. So you're not engaging in social action, you're withdrawing from social action. Um, yeah, so if consciousness sometimes constitutes unhappiness for a man, it is only by achieving a morbid development in which revolting against its own very nature, it poses as an absolute, okay? So um, yeah, so consciousness, self-consciousness becomes an absolute, the ultimate end of life thinking, right, and reflecting on one's, uh, you know, impressions and experiences and so on, and seeks its purpose in itself. Um, far from being ultimate conquest of knowledge, uh, the chief elements here of the stoic frame of mind, that's what you wind up with, stoicism, this heavy emphasis upon self-reflection, right, calm melancholy. 
So Stoicism teaches man to detach himself from everything external in order to live by and through himself. Only the doctrine um, ends in suicide, since then life has no reason. Okay, so the person who commits stoic, egoistic suicide um, has nothing violent or hasty about the unfolding of the act. The sufferer selects his own time, meditates on his plan well in advance. He's not even repelled by his last moments. There's a calm melancholy not unpleasant that marks his last moments. He analyzes himself to the last, and he gives an example uh, or two of that. So uh, this, so so suicide here is uh, accompanied by melancholy, sort of depressed detachment, um, over individuation. Um, the individual isolates himself. Um, he ties uh, the ties uniting him with others are slackened or broken. I just really like that image of a slackened tie or slackened rope, and therefore uh, or broken ties leaving the individual really a free-floating being, um, uniting him with others like a broken... Society is not sufficiently integrated at the points. By the way, integration is an interesting term here. Um, integrate. It actually is related to... Um, i got to remember my etymology here. It means something like um, uh, untouched, if I remember right. So something that's been untouched, that is still whole, that has not been uh, parted in some way, right? Or split or divided. So it, something that is integrated um, is untouched. It, 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 it is intact, I think is a good way to put it. Intact, right? Has not been cut, has not been damaged, has not been, you know, altered in some way. So this is a society that's intact, that is whole. All its pieces are there. And that's what's missing, right? So the gaps between one another individual consciousness uh, are estrange them, make them strangers to each other, and um, yeah, and, and and result from the weakening of the social fabric. So you wind up in this emptiness of inner reverie, right? Void of all positive comment. Um, yeah. So there it is. So that's the first type. So the first type of egoistic suicidal consciousness, that form of moral energy, um, one gets lost in infinite self reflection caught up in one's thought, caught up in one's ideas and one's impressions and one's sadness maybe even, or the futility of life. You aren't drawn out into the world, but you're withdrawn from it. And as Durkheim seems to write uh, that the egoist is the person who commits suicide with low energy. You're basically like a battery that has wound down right? Or a clock that is wound down or a battery that has been depleted. So you're not committing suicide in, in a kind of excess of energy. It's the opposite. Your energies have been depleted. You're kind of melancholy, uh, depressed, and so on, right? The second form of, of egoistic suicide is the Epicurean egoist. Um, and again, and this is the person who assigns himself the single task of satisfying. I'm sorry for the gendered language. I'll just use it. Um, but but you could degender this immediately. It, it refers to men and women both. He assigns himself the single task of satisfying his personal needs, even simplifying them to make uh, this easier, knowing that he can hope for nothing better. He asks nothing more prepared. Um, if unable to reach a single end to terminate a thenceforth meaningless existence, that's Epicurean suicide, right? So the Epicurean lives only as long as they found any interest in doing so. Sensual pleasure is the main focus of life, but it's a pretty slight link to attach people to life. And uh, therefore, it's, it means it's fairly easy uh, to end it. So you're even more passionless and um, your only goal is to minimize pain, right? So it's the infinite uh, desire. It's the death of, uh, you know, the, the, it's the consciousness of infinite desire and of unattained uh, pleasures, things that you can't get. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this then. So in, um, yeah, so in, in, in terms of desire, the egoist is the person who ceases to locate him or herself as the object of other people's desire. Okay, and in 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 so you're just simply withdrawing, you're unplugging, as Durkheim says, you're you're winding down. There's not much energy in an egoistic suicide or in an egoistic form of consciousness that has yet to uh, commit suicide. So you're saying a great no to the moral energies of life. A no. The Stoic ceases to be the object of desire, and the Epicurean ceases to desire altogether. So what does that mean? All right. To give an example of this, I often use this in class. I think this is from 2012. This is Will I Am 
Um, um, and it, it's from like, uh, I think a New Year's Eve uh, performance where I think there's a total of 10 dancers on stage, all of whom have an iPad in the place of a face. So instead of a mask, like in Goffman, right, they were wearing iPads. And the iPads all um, um, were, you know, were basically um, broadcasting Will I Am's face, right? So I think he's behind his own iPad image, but it's being, uh, you know, doubled, tripled, quadrupled, and so on in the face of the other dancers. Well, I really like that image, this idea that society is, um, um, that, that the social self that we have, the social double, remember, homo duplex, to, to Durkheim, we are homo duplex, we're man the doubled, person the doubled, we have our physical or individual being, and then we have our social self, okay. So, uh, so I really like the idea that our social self is something virtual, it isn't actually a physical mask, and that it requires energy, it must be energized in order to be effective. So I tried to draw this in the way that I teach it. So here's what I sort of had is, is the Will I Am uh, 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 dance routine. So again, here is, uh, this is homo duplex, right? Okay. And uh, so here's the individual uh, sort of uh, psychological or biological uh, self. And then here is the social self. Okay, the mask or something like that. Okay, so the social self, the social part of the self is fueled or energized by society, right? So there's a flow. So that's what this is. So the energy from society flows in and out through desire. Okay, that's where the moral energy uh, flows in and out from. So remember, in, in, in Freud, you are blocked from realizing your immediate desire you're prevented from doing it, that energy then flows in and out of society. So you get to enjoy a little bit through your social portal, and uh, but you have to give your life to society to do it. So you begin to desire uh, society itself. You desire through the portal. You desire through this connection between the social self and society, okay? So to be energized as a social being in Durkheim's terms or in Freud's terms is to be connected to society. That's what energizes the social self. All right. So the egoist is the person who says no to the moral order. No, I don't want that social self. I don't want it. I'm going to uh, detach from it. So I'm trying to draw here sort of a detached cord and a no to the, uh, to the iPad face. So the Stoic says no to the energy of other people's desire. I don't want other people's desire, right? I'm gonna get caught up in my own self-reflection. Uh, other people don't really seem real to me. I only seem real to myself. And my social double doesn't seem particularly fascinating to me. I get caught in my own self-reflection. Or put another way, the social unconscious is structured to really heavily weight uh, the iPad face with the uh, determinants of individuality so that it is normal in an egoistically structured society for individuals to view themselves, right, as the most real thing in, and the others in society as not real. In other words, in an egoistic society, the social self um, is, is, becomes kind of a mirror surface, right? That, that what you see when you look into the social self is yourself, right? Um, at, you know, with, with socially infused self, but it's still a self, an, uh, an, an individual. And in altruistic society, a traditional society, when you, when you view your social self or when others view you in the guise of your social self, you're going to be reflecting back the group itself, right? The totem. So let's say in traditional society, this is the witchetty grub totem. Again, I just love that name. Uh, you know, your social self is going to be a witchetty grub, right? So in traditional society, you're going to be altruistic, which means that your social self is going to take on the form, the appearance. It's going to mime or mimic uh, the this social consciousness of the group. In an, in an egoistic, modern society, your social self is still going to be heavily individualistic. Okay? All right. So the Stoic then is going to say no to the energy of other people's desire are going to refuse to be the object of desire. So the Stoic gets caught up in their own self-reflection and doesn't uh, desire uh, others, um, or excuse me, do, no, and ceases to desire other people's desire, right? I don't want other people to want me. I'm caught up in my own 
self-reflection. Now, the Epicurean says no to desire itself. The Epicurean just stops desire, right? Um, you know, so like old men who are unable to enjoy some of the pleasures of the flesh or let's say um, who have medical uh, illness or something that prevents them from enjoying, um, you know, uh, the table and, 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 and a glass of wine or something like that, whatever the pleasures are that people would, would, would want. Um, that when you begin, when those pleasures begin to wane, um, you just simply cease to desire. And that's the Epicurean egoist. Um, basically, you're in society, you're only in this game long enough to enjoy, and the moment that the enjoyment ends, uh, you're gone, right? So you refuse to seek others as objects of desire to seek desiring. So in egoism, the social self is heavily individualistic, and the individual believes that the the self is their own property. It doesn't belong to society. In an altruistic traditional society, the individual believes themselves to be not their own property, but to be the property of society. But the individual in this instance doesn't. Okay. All right. So there it is. So um, let's try this one more time here. So page 278 to 283. Um, um, again, this is sort of my hand uh, written notes here, but uh, so this is sort of narcissistic egoism. Um, it, you know, they're both narcissistic, both Stoic and Epicurean, right? Self-absorption or self-love to the point of self-worship. Uh, you tend to draw in energy from others, feed vampire-like off of others, uh, utterly dependent upon the reflection of others to sustain, to sustain your grandiose self. So I've got this drawn a little differently here where you need other people's deference to give you demeanor, like in, in Goffman's. Uh, terms. Um, I kind of like the way this is drawn better with the will I am example that your um, that your social self is is um, given energy by the group around, right? Which I think works better. So in this case, you're an egoist. You need your social double to be energized by other people. So you need connection to others so that they can keep yourself organized, right? I mean, narcissists, especially like malignant narcissists, need other people to worship them, to give energy to their grandiose self. It's called narcissistic supply, right? And and so they're looking always for others to worship them, to tell them how great they are, smart they are, good looking they are, whatever it would be, right? Uh, you know, uh, how great they are, how, you know, I'm the best ever, that kind of thing. Uh, nobody's as good as me sounding like a certain president that I know at the moment. But but the egoist is dependent upon society to energize that social self, right? Okay, so the egoist and the, and the Epicurean, this egoistic Stoic and the egoistic Epicurean both say no. So uh, the Stoic, um, the external world is to be treated with detachment, only the self is real. So other people don't really uh, uh, matter. So you create a kind of vacuum between the self and other people, which unplugs that the iPad of the social self, which then begins to wind down. So the symptoms then, once you create that vacuum between the self and the other, hey, you other people, I don't need you or I don't want you any longer. I'm going to detach from you because I'm caught up in my own grandiosity. There's a withdrawal of energy. The self winds down, right, as energy from others is removed. Calm melancholy, unhurried, um, again, elaborate, planned death with cool detachment. You cease to be the object of others' desire, right? I don't need others. I don't want others. I'm just going to unplug from them. All right, so the Epicurean goes the other direction. Um, um, this is more commonplace. Uh, it's a more common form of consciousness. It's a cheerful form of suicide. One live only lives only so long as... Um, you know, pleasures are derived, and once pleasures of life are gone uh, or dried up, suicide without renunci uh, without rumination or fascination, just, you know, minimizing pain. So you give up voluptuously, right? No longer continue easy pleasures. I'm going to, they kill themselves with ironic tranquility. It's like ironic tranquility and matter of factness, right? So the Epicurean ceases to desire, right? I don't, I'm not going to desire at all. Okay. I think that works. All right. Yeah, see, they're both are saying no to moral energies of society. They're both a depleted form of consciousness. All right. All right. So they're both suffering from a kind of, of uh, infinity disease. So where can we see that here? Um, yeah. So this is going to go on. Yeah. 
so on page 287 when he continues to write about various you know literary examples um you know egoism and anomy are both considered uh in, in you know diseases of the infinite um and he claims that the um egoist is um yeah the egoist is suffering from the disease of of infinite dreams and the um the um anomic person is the disease of infinite desire so more on that as we go forward and look at, at some of these other cases okay so let's see if we can get to my next uh, uh example here okay so that takes care of epic uh, of egoism now altruism is our next section so the altruist, so if the egoist says no to moral energy, the altruist says, hell yes, I want a lot of it, right? So it's a big yes to moral energy. You know, you so instead of unplugging from society, you're plugged in completely. And instead of seeing yourself as fundamentally separate from society, the altruist sees themselves as fundamentally and in, 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 in primarily a member of society itself, right? So you're, you're fundamentally plugged in. So the altruist is lost in or consumed by the desire of the big other of society itself, right? What does the big other want of me determines who I am, right? The symbolic mandates of the big other negate the self. That's what I want to do. There's the obligatory form, the suicide by duty, where you accept the symbolic mandate, the orders from the God, right? The call from the God to destroy the self. The optional uh, or the status-oriented uh, suicide, you accept the symbolic mandate or the, the uh, call from the God as a source of honor or the avoidance of dishonor. The acute form of altruist says yes to light, complete yes to the moral energies from the big other. And you just simply go out in enthusiastic blaze of glory, um, you know, flooding of the self into the big other. You just want to sort of merge the self into the big other. Okay. All right. So how does that work out? Um, okay. I've got it here. I have a nice little drawing of that somewhere if I can locate it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I always say if I can locate it, and when it's and when it's this late at night, I may not be able to. Um, let me see if it's here. Yeah, here it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't worth the wait. I look at this sometimes, I, I can't believe I'm making you wait for this. But anyway, here it is. Uh, so what... <laughs> So this, so this is a, um, a horror. <laughs> it is really, it's been a long day. Anyway, uh, this is altruistic suicide. What does the other, <laughs> I haven't looked at this in a while. What does the other one of me, uh, so the other's desire is like a carrot attached to the head and you just run off of a cliff. The altruist pursuit of the desire of the other is absolute. Uh, yes, I will. Do what you say, big other. So there we go. Um, oh gosh. Anyhow, um, sorry I made you wait for that. So let's 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 go back. <laughs> let's go back to our book here. Okay. All right. So on page two eighty three, we get a description of altruistic suicide and the different forms of it. So in in uh, chapter four of book two, uh, this is chapter six. But in chapter four, uh, Durkheim has already specified the three subtypes of altruistic suicide. It's obligatory suicide by duty, um, uh, you know, uh, enthusiastic mystical suicide, um, and then the optional uh, status orienting uh, uh, um, su um, um, altruistic suicide. So he specifies these then and how you can tell the difference. So the suicide by duty is, um, again, involves a certain expenditure of energy. It's always, these are always energetic. It takes action and you're, you're actively doing, um, doing the death, right? Whereas in egoism, you're kind of, uh, it's kind of a wound down, slow, deliberate death, um, quiet, that kind of thing. These are deaths with energy, right? So altruistic suicide, uh, again, violent emotion, strong energy, right? In the case of obligatory suicide, energy is controlled by reason and the will. The individual kills himself at the command of his conscience. He submits to an imperative. 
Thus, the dominant note of his act is the serene conviction derived from the feeling of duty accomplished, like, you know, Cato uh, the Younger, right? Um, or, um, um, or some French soldier who I don't know about. When altruism is at a high pitch, the mystic enthusiastic kind, you know, like throwing yourself under the juggernaut and that kind of thing, um, the impulse is more passionate and unthinking. It's a burst of faith and enthusiasm, enthusiasm that carries someone to their death, right? The enthusiasm itself is either happy or somber, depending on the conception of death, as either a happy union with a beloved deity or an ex expiatory, you know, purging, um, you know, purifying sacrifice as a means um, of to appease some probably hostile power, right? So it depends upon that. So it's a very active, 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 religious fervor, right? Throwing themselves below the wheels of the chariot that we saw earlier, that kind of thing, right? Or the monk that lights themselves ablaze, right? Uh, to make a point or something. All right. And then so in the optional forms of suicide, suicide by do, uh, for honor, uh, the optional form, it's a little bit different. It's, you know, he talks about it being about disillusion, but, uh, but in general, it, it isn't dissimilar from suicide by duty, right? Um, you, it generally, it occurs with ease, a spontaneous instinct, and so on, right? Um, yeah, and, the, and then the a kind of calmness. He writes about a man who, whose rope broke while trying to hang himself, and then he calmly writes a little passage about, oh, this is interesting, and then goes back and accomplishes his... his his goal the second time around. Okay, so that's so there we go. So so altruistic consciousness. Then it is uh, uh, it is those those three forms. Um, again, this is very hard to read, but I'll give it to you anyway. Here, this is my own like notes. Um, identification with the desire of the big other. Full yes to the moral energies. The symbolic mandate is completely accepted. Fully negating the individual self. You completely identify with the society. You view yourself and your body. Um, as belonging to society. Hence, if society wants you to die, you'll die. Okay, so the obligatory, again, moral imperative. Uh, it's by the command. You are you follow the, the will. Uh, you are the instrument of the will of the big other. Serene conviction. Uh, uh, again, uh, you know, no doubts, no turmoil. Optional, the self is apart from the symbolic imperative. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this, so if you look deep into uh, chapter 2, where he has a discussion of, of um, yeah, like on page 222, where he has this discussion of optional altruism, he talks about people who will basically kill themselves to win a bet um, or to, you know, he calls it the immoderate, a futile, immoderate suicide of people who, um, you know, yeah, if they lose money or get too drunk or, uh, you know, um, yeah, this idea, uh, if, you, if you get in a quarrel, you'll commit suicide. If a conjugal quarrel or jealous impulse uh, arises among Native Americans, he said, you don't have a lot of impulse control, he says, you'll, you'll have uh, a, a suicide. Again, not always um, politically correct, Durkheim, in uh, the late 1890s. Um, and then among the Dakotas and Creeks, the least disappointment all leads to desperate steps. So that's a reference, again, back down to Mary Eastman's book. And those two passages that he cites, I believe one of them is to that maiden rock that we talked about in the last video, um, you know, where the woman uh, commits suicide because, um, you know, I think she, she was forced to marry someone else she didn't want to marry or something. And then there's another account of a woman whose um, son has gotten married and, and has had children and, and no longer needs her. And because her son, the big other, no longer needs her, she uh, attempts suicide. I don't think she commits it, but she attempts to commit suicide. And the reason that Durkheim um, is pointing to here is that the, that the attempted suicide uh, is done because there, is, um, there isn't enough, right? that there isn't enough individual self, egoism in the self to sustain um, uh, oneself in the, in, in the face of a setback or something like that, right? Okay, so, so that's what that's referencing there. So in an optional suicide, you're either getting out because the big other doesn't want you anymore and you don't want to dishonor yourself anymore, uh, or you're, um, you're, you're, you're getting out because the big other, you know, you've been replaced or something and so you're dying. You don't have enough individual self 
ego. You don't have enough of an ego, selfishness to stay in the world if the, if the big other doesn't want you. Okay, so you don't have enough individual self to withstand an attack or a, a, a rejection. Then in acute, it's a complete engulfment of the self and collective consciousness. Um, you know, you're trying to merge with the big other, um, you know, deep longing for mystical union with the big other, burst of faith and enthusiasm, that kind of thing. You know, it's the, it's the death of, of religious mystics or people who die uh, in battle happily because they're dying for their unit or for their, their society. Okay, now we're on to anomi and anomic uh, uh, suicide. So let me see if I can get my getting too many pages thrown around here. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I still cannot quite believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay. So in anomic suicide. Um, what we're faced with here is an inabil inability to stabilize desire. So it's really interesting. In, in the last instance, um, you know, Durkheim winds up sort of pointing to economic action almost as like the major realm of, of anomi. And then also um, um, what he calls, you know, conjugal relations, love relations, marriage. In other words, object relations. So it's objects in the form of other specific people, loved ones, and so on, or objects in the form of, of economic goods, you know, consumption. All right, so the anomic thing, unable to stabilize desire, that the object of desires seem to flee, that the means and the, uh, the means to achieve objects of desire are not sufficient to arrive. You often miss your object, as he says, he keeps talking about that, missing one's object. Um, yeah, so, so the objects of desire flee around. The uh, other objects don't seem to want you. I'm trying to draw here something. I was talking class about like, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Quidditch game in Harry Potter, right? The snitch that flies around, right? And you're trying to catch that snitch. That's what it's like to desire in a condition of anomie, is that you're not just pursuing a fixed object with a fixed aim and, and, and kind of like a stable track, but you're on this, this constantly fluctuating, um, you know, reversing um, uh, instrument pursuing an object of desire that is itself fluctuating and fleeting around and, and fluttering and so on. So it's, so you often do not achieve your object. And even when you do, the object often doesn't satisfy uh, in the way that one would have thought. Okay. So what you get then is, is he said you get frustrated, angry, violent, frustration, focused at either A, a specific person, where you have infinite desire that's unsatisfied, or um, life in general, or God, uh, infinite desire unsatisfied. So in both of these cases, you got this desire, you can't satisfy your desire, your desire seems to grow uh, exponentially, your ability to achieve your desire doesn't. Um, in fact, you lose the way to do it. And so then you either, you get this anger, frustration that's directed, um, yeah, at, uh, yeah. So, so this is where he writes about uh, Chateaubriand again and René, um, where he says, my soul not yet worn out by passion. So let's get that paragraph here. So I'm looking at my notes, but I have it here. Yeah. So the anomic suicide, this is on page 284. Um, anger, disappointment, um, yeah, irritation, exasperated wariness, um, blas um, blasphemies, violent recriminations against life in general, threats and accusations against a particular person sometimes. So again, there's the two forms, specific against one person or, or a limited group of people, and then life in general, um, all kinds of unhappiness everywhere, right? Yeah. So very destructive, acute overexcitation is sort of the mental state that one is in. So uh, as, as he says, uh, again, especially in specific uh, anomie, specific anomie, suicides are often preceded by a murder. A man kills himself after having killed someone else whom he accuses of having ruined his life, right? So you get really angry at someone, you kill them first, then you kill themselves. These murder suicides, which are so common, um, I, you know, in, um, um, in domestic, uh, uh, settings. And many of the suicide bombers have been, that's suicide bombers, I'm sorry, but many of the, um, like spree killers have been similar to that, being really, really angry at family members or 
being really, really angry at a certain number of women and they go out and, uh, and shooting them or being angry at, um, you know, certain groups of high school um, uh, cliques, um, you know, like like what apparently happened at uh, at Columbine High School, right? When the, when the mass shooter uh, went in, um, they were targeting specific people who had um, injured them in some way, right? So you're really angry, violent, and killing others before killing yourself, right? So the suicide... Suicidal, egos, suicidal egoist never yields to such displays of violence. So the egoist doesn't, isn't violent. So if there's violence towards others, it's never egoism, right? It's always going to have this anomic component to it. All right. Uh, and so that mournful quiet of the egoist is gone. You get this violent anger, right? And hurting other people is the whole point, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so the nature of anomic suicide. Unregulated emotions are adjusted neither to one another nor to the conditions they're supposed to meet. At the, that, that kind of Merton's, Robert Merton's strain theory here, the ends of life and the means to achieve them are out of whack. You get new ends that emerge in capitalism, new objects that you can't achieve or, or, or acquire. And then even if you're pursuing ends, um, objects, a wife, a husband, um, a, a lover, uh, through typical means, the means don't get you there like they used to in the past. Or remember when Durkheim writes about domestic anomie, the breakup of a home through divorce, um, or or you know breakup of of a conjugal relation through you know a, a love affair ending, uh, that kind of thing, right? So anomic suicide. All right, um, disillusionment, disappointment, exasperation. Um, again, suicide is often preceded by homicide. Uh, again, those two types, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so there it is. So he goes into a, a lot of that. He talks about uh, uh, Goethe's, uh, you know, uh, Ver young Werther, um, the turbulent heart enamored of infinity, uh, killing himself from disappointed love, case of all artists who after having drunk deeply of success commit suicide because of a chance hiss, um, you know, that kind of thing because their popularity has begun to wane. So, so yeah, again, you, you know, he, he's using examples from, you know, popular culture and from uh, literature here. So, um, yeah, ir irritated uh, disgust of life. That's the general one, right? So you get the specific and the general. So he talks about Chateaubriand's René, which is really weird. There's an um, incestuous love in here. A young man who seems to want everything, right? A 20-year-old or something who just can't seem to... Uh, um, settle on a, on, on a stable path of life. Parents are dead. He falls in love with his sister, uh, who then um, goes into the convent. He winds up running off to America, leaves France, runs to America, joins a Native American tribe, and gets killed in a war with um, um, with the French, if I remember right. So yeah, desires his sister and then runs away to the Nat join the Natchez tribe. Um, so so really so again that disease of infinite desire right so infinite desire desire that can't be satisfied desire that's out of all measure uh, to the means to achieve it that's all that's anomie and altruism is the infinity of dreams okay and then and then um, um, the two subtypes the stoic is the person who's lost in the infinity of self reflection so it's the dreams that are self reflection. And in the Epicurean case, it's the dreams of 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 pleasure, the dreams of infinite um, infinite pleasures. Yeah, hopefully I had that right. I had infinite desire written in here. It really isn't that. It's unattained pleasures. Yeah, so scratch that. Okay. All right. So there we are. I think we're about there. Now we're done. So now we're done with with all of the subtypes. So we have our major types of suicide and the subtypes specified, right? So again, just to quickly go through our list, we have egoistic suicide with the two subtypes, stoic and epicurean. We have altruistic suicide with the subtypes obligatory, optional, and acute. And we have anomic suicide with the two subtypes, specific and general. Then we have fatalism, and recall fatalism, um, which I hope I still have here somewhere. Fatalism is the next type. Let's just talk about it quickly again. So in fatalism, again, we only have a footnote, but let's just still include it. Um, you have an inability to launch or sustain desire, an inability to stage or screen desire due to the constrictions of the big other, the infinite demands of the big other, 
okay? Individuals desire and ability to desire are therefore precluded, choked, made impossible by the overwhelming, overmastering demands of the big other, okay? So this is the disease, this is my uh, term, but the disease of the other's infinite demands, okay? Um, so there can, and this is now taking Durkheim. So remember how Durkheim says in that footnote, well, there's a couple of these. It's the specific other that's making infinite demand, which would be like the wife for the young man or the family for the young man or the master for the specific slave or, or the, um, you know, the inability to realize desire on the part of the woman who can't have children because she's married to a husband who's, uh, you know, impotent or, or infertile or something that her, her, her desire is choked by a specific other, right? The infinite demand of the big other, you must be my wife regardless. And, uh, and, and, and there she is sort of caught. And then the other fatalism is, 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 a, is just simply the big other, not a specific other, but the big other, you know, a system of symbolic, um, uh, suppression, so like an entire system of slavery or something like that. In our contemporary world, so again, you know, Durkheim talks about the death of the slave, withdrawal of life when energy has been uh, sucked out of one, basically. You know, I have all these films about vampires and zombies where one sort of gives up living when one has been sort of depleted of the capacity to enjoy life. The world of debt payments, high debt payments, you know, student de uh, uh, debt that seems to be off the rails, you know, bankruptcy reforms that have taken place in the last, what, 12 years or so that eliminate all possibility for um, for debt to be discharged, which means that you're committed now to a lifetime of, 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 of debt payments. Um, you know, a world of wage slavery, you know, if you're living uh, basically at a living, bare living wage or beneath the living wage, uh, the big other takes all from you, leaving nothing behind. Um, you know, we know, you know, like the Foxconn factory a few years ago, this is a factory in China. Um, uh, I think in, in, um, uh, Shenzhen, I think is where it's located, but it, it, it's a factory that manufactured, um, you know, like Apple products and, you know, the, 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 the hardware for Apple. And they had to put suicide nets outside uh, the buildings because workers were jumping out and killing themselves. And they put nets outside. Um, basically, you know, you're locked into this system of low wage employment, working long hours, unable to get ahead. And again, people just sort of break down from that. And uh, I think that's fatalistic uh, suicide. So there we have all of the individual forms. All right. Um, so again, um, just to put it one more time, egoism, stoic, epicurean, altruism, obligatory, optional, and acute, and no me, specific and general, and fatalism. All right, now we have three more forms, and then we're done. All right, the acute forms. So let's sort of look at these. Um, all right, so so um, if we can look here, our drawing. Okay, so what we're trying to do now, we've specified the the major forms and the s secondary forms at each of the four corners. Now we're going to look at three compound forms of suicide, of suicidal ideation, of moral energy flows, of, uh, of consciousness, right? Forms of consciousness, any, any of those terms work, that, that reside by, you know, somewhere in the middle, not at the corners of the social field, it's somewhere in the middle because they're combining uh, multiple flows of energy. So this begins um, uh, at page um, 288. It only is a couple pages long, so we could, I tell you, let's just use this book. Uh, page 288 is the combination of egoism and anomie. Okay, so egoism and anomie. So let's look at that on our map. So egoism is up here. It's a modern form um, uh, where you're, you remain unattached to society. You're kind of lost in yourself. And look, anomie, a modern form where, uh, where you don't have the specific rules and kind of unregulated desire. So you have both forms of infinity disease at once, right? So that's what this is. This is like both of the negative infinity diseases occurring at the same time. All right, so how does that manifest itself? Well, it seems to me that what that leads to, here, I'm, I'm going to use my notes just because it'll save us time. Um, you have an alternating phase shift between melancholic depression, uh, where you would draw into yourself and sort of wind down, and then agitated uh, um, uh um, you know, moving out into the world, um, 
in order to, to achieve dreams with action, right? So you, you get agitated, you have desires, you go out into the world to try to achieve those desires to approach objects um, using what means you have available, you fail, you come back uh, with reflective sadness. So you get this kind of bipolar consciousness and it kind of, fe so, so it's not technically psychologically bipolar, um, but, but, but it's going to have that kind of shape to it, right? Where you're going to have these moments of reaching out, withdrawing, reaching out, withdrawing, energetically attempting to achieve, getting agitated and withdrawing and, and, and so on. And, and the way Durkheim describes it is that these waves get larger. So you withdraw from desire and, and you detach from others at moments. That's the egoism. And then you energetically and frustratingly experience failed attempts uh, to achieve uh, unstable desire. So it's really, really uh, um, a painful form of consciousness, right? And um, and yeah, so we did. So so it just really sounds pretty bad. So so you get these mixed suicides. So this is a very painful form of consciousness, right? Um, yeah. The melancholy inspired by this thought drives him to new self-escape, increasing uneasiness and, and discontent. Thus are produced mixed suicides where depression alternates with agitation, dream with action, transports of desire with reflective sadness. So a really dark form of consciousness. So again, this is where people have these, you know, all of these failed attempts at love or failed attempts at, at success in business or failed attempts at jobs and then constant withdrawal. And at some point you either end on the anomic side violently or you know maybe even implicating others or on the egoistic side um you know where you're you know this kind of wound down uh, sad uh death okay anomic altruism um is another combined form so let's look at that again in anomic altruism we have okay so anomi is located over here uh it's it's a world of few rules uh, but it's it's modern, so it, it it's a world where you have very few rules. But it's a world, however, where you have a kind of high level of identity, psychological identity or imaginary identity um, with a group. So your psychological attachment and identity is to a group, but your regulatory, your everyday regulatory structure is um anomic you're you're disconnected from people okay is that correct i hope i have this right yeah okay so this is god i don't like that i just put that but anyway it's the suicide of the besieged i know how i want to do it so yeah so you're locked into a group altruistically and that group is anomic is under siege so so um so let's so this is like at the very end of that great book uh excuse me that great film downfall the great film that has all the Hitler memes, you know, that that film depicts this moral energy shape. A society that is with strong altruism, strong attachment, coupled with enemy. It's going down, right? It's falling apart. It's going down. Um, I suspect that if, again, this is September 2020, I don't know what the outcome of the election is going to be, but I suspect that this form of consciousness will be widespread if Donald Trump loses. And uh, that Trumpism, it has a lot of altruism in it, that there's a lot of identity. Again, the, the, um, you know, all of the people who, who directly identify with the man Trump, not with the Republican Party, the conservative movement, but with the man Trump, they're very altruistically identified. Um, if, if he goes down, um, then I would suspect that there would be a lot of um, energy released. Uh, remember, anami, anomi is always violent. So whether it's violence towards the self or violence towards others is another open question. But, but, but in many ways, um, Donald Trump in September of 2020 has basically described himself as someone who is besieged. Uh, there are enemies about to take his, his presidency away, and he's claimed Again, I hope, again, we're two months away. I hope it doesn't happen. But he's claimed that he may actually, um, you know, uh, 
act like someone who's under siege and hole up in the White House and not and not leave, right? And then try to use machinations of military or legal apparatus and so on to try to uh, negate the election and not go. He'll be besieged during that time, and we can expect that this particular energy form uh, will be released. So again, what is this? This is people who are tightly connected to a group, and the group is is under attack or beginning to, to fall. Okay. All right. So the next one then is egoism, altruism. So these are uh, two forms of, of uh, moral energy. They're at opposite ends of the attachment identity uh, um, uh, integration bond, right? So altruists ha are heavily identified with other people, tend to be traditional. Egoists are identified with an individual self and tend to be detached from society. How can these two things go together? Actually, I think this one is really interesting. So here he claims that, look, um, you have people who are egoistically distributed in a society, unconnected. And they seek some durable object to which to attach themselves permanently and which shall give meaning to their lives. So they're not currently in an altruistic society. They're in an egoistic society where people are individuated and they are feeling meaningless. And so there's casting about for something to give their life meaning. And what they, what they wind up uh, going for is, um, is this some durable object to attach themselves to. All right, so what's the durable object? Well, it can't be anything real. Uh, so they can find satisfaction only in creating out of whole cloth some ideal reality uh, to play their, this role. So in thought, uh, in thought, they create an imaginary being whose slaves they become and to which they devote themselves the more exclusively, right? To it, they assign all the attachment to existence which they ascribe to themselves, since all else is valueless in their eyes. So they live a twofold contradictory existence. They're individualists so far as the real world is concerned. They're egoistically selfish. They're attached to themselves to disconnect from the world. But they are immoderate altruists to everything that concerns this ideal objective. Both dispositions lead to suicide. So I'm, I'm going to include here people who uh, join, say, a religious cult of some kind or a, a radical religious sect. Um, and this is actually, we know, like from, from the great book by John Laughlin. Uh, I'll write it down here, John Laughlin's book um, from, God, I think, the 60s. Uh, it was called Doomsday Cult, about the Moonies. It's really a, a book about the uh, techniques used by the Moonies, by cult figures, to acquire new adherents. And... Um, what they look for are people who are individuated, who really don't have strong ties to an existing altruistic group, and then they bond them together uh, by giving them this imaginary being uh, uh, to honor and worship. I think a lot of religious groups work, work this way. I think a lot of religions that depend upon uh, conversion experiences, uh, you know, people converting into that faith, um, are, are like this. They're casting about looking for egoists or individualists who are seeking meaning in their lives. They, are, they don't have anything real, and so they wind up uh, finding this imaginary being as, an, as a durable object to give meaning to their lives. And then in everyday life, they don't necessarily live out the, um, uh, the in uh, an altruistic life, giving, caring for others, and so on, but in their mind, they're attached as a kind of narcissistic extension of the self to their imaginary icon, their imaginary god, their imaginary figure. Again, to a degree, again, I, I in my lifetime, I have not seen such strong identification of, of political, um, and again, like normally unpolitical people to a political figure, as I've seen uh, Trump, uh, you know, Trumpists, uh, uh, followers of Donald Trump feel towards Donald Trump. And so, um, and, and you can kind of see this, like people have been casting around for meaning, right? We looked at the suicides of despair at the beginning of this lecture series, you know, people who could turn to alcohol or to drug addiction or to overdosing or just to suicide itself, uh, or you can find meaning by attaching to a durable object, an imaginary being who's, um, yeah, just look at this, imaginary being whose slaves they become and to which they devote themselves, the more exclusive, the more they are detached from everything else. 
So once you begin giving up everything else in the pursuit of what? Of being a, a groupie to Trump rallies or something like that. Um, yeah. Again, this is a different phenomenon. I think, I think, again, I'm not really trying to be political here and singling out um, uh, one particular political leader. I've just not seen this uh, to this degree, where there's almost a religious cult-like following to, um, to a politician, right? And um, so at any rate, but I think a lot of religions work this way too. You know, like, like religions where, again, you're devoted to your God, the specific God of you and a group of others around you uh, that you see on, on Saturday or Sunday, but you don't really live out, um, you know, say the, the uh, prescriptions of that group uh, during the week. So, you know, it'd be like Christians who um, strongly hold on to their Christian identity while completely ignoring the Ten Commandments and, say, the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, that kind of thing, uh, the Beatitudes. All right, so here we are then. We now have a total of 11 forms of suicide, uh, which, which correspond to 11 moral energy currents, which correspond to 11 sort of forms of consciousness resulting from the unconscious structure of society. So we have egoism and the two secondary. So this is all on page 293 in the book, 293. So you have this very handy summary. I'll try to zoom in on this a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So there you are. So you've got egoistic suicide uh, and then the two types of, of Stoicism and Epicureanism. You have altruistic suicide and the three subtypes, uh, suicide by duty, uh, right? Obligatory, the mystic enthusiasm one, and then the one of, of, uh, of, of optional or honorific, the one with peaceful courage. Um, then you have anomic suicide, the two types of violent Criminations against life in general, and then the specific one against the specific, the murder homicide uh, um, a scenario. Then you have ego anomic suicide. This is the mixed type, um, the mixture of agitation, apathy, of action, reverie. You got the anomic altruistic suicide, which is exasperated effervescence, and then the ego altruistic suicide, melancholy, tempered with moral fortitude, which is a weird way to put that one, but we'll leave it. And then add fatalism in as the last type. So there's the 11. Okay, so um, we, we've got it. Um, so I think we now have reached the end of the book. So um, again, it's an, it's an astonishing accomplishment um, that, um, again, that really helps us understand sort of not, not just suicide, but uh, self-destructive acts, right? You would think that in a modern society, human beings would primarily be oriented towards um, defining rational ends and pursuing those ends um, reasonably, that they'd be all about creating sort of uh, decent cooperative political associations that allow them to flourish. That doesn't happen very often. So Durkheim sort of explains um, the, 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 the unconscious structures that compel people towards self-destruction and self-negation, self-abuse even, um, sometimes short of actual suicide, right? Um, um, like joining a movement or something that is actually against your interests, uh, or going all the way and explaining suicide itself. So again, the book is really not so much a theory of suicide or an attempt to intervene in a suicidal activity. It's there, especially there, like in the third book, he comes back to this, the third section of the book that we didn't cover. But it primarily is really a book about the... Um, um, about social solidarity and about the relative modernity of different societies and then about the negative effects of living in such a society upon human subjects. Okay? All right. With that, we shall stop. Thank you. Hope it was helpful.